Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today we have another program in this new series we started called Consciousness and Sustainability. We're just investigating where that leads and our guest today is Tony Wright. Hi Hello, Tony. Ian. And Tony's written a book called Left in the Dark which I got hold of a copy of uh, a couple of months ago and I really found a very fascinating read and we're going to find out more about Tony, why he wrote the book and of course what the book is all about. So Tony, you got to this stage many years ago in your mid-twenties where you felt that things didn't quite add up. So what, what happened there? Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it really was um, a sort of an evolving process where I'd, I'd always had a, a rather sceptical view of anything that wasn't testable, provable, and I, I was in, involved in a, a sort of an academic learning process. Um, I was involved in plant sciences, genetics and molecular biology and so on. Um, and I could see quite early on that some of the things that I was being taught and parts of the syllabus didn't quite make sense to me, the way humans were living their lives and the science behind it all. Um, and also I, I had a circle of friends, uh, well a small number of friends who were interested in things that up, up, to, up to that time I would have had very little interest in, been very sceptical about sort of um, interest in spirituality, shamanism, this kind of thing. Um, but eventually I got to a point where I could see maybe these things, you know, they, they will make sense and uh, I, I, I really set out to investigate, um, partly through a process of self-experimentation. And the further I got with that, the more intrigued I got and uh, ended up becoming somewhat obsessed by getting to the bottom of these things. So what kind of experimentation did you do? Uh, well, well, to start with, um, uh, I was very interested in um, theories of evolution, and it seemed to make sense on the, on the sort of surface of it. However, I, I could see where it didn't seem to be applied to humans, um, despite the sort of the, the classic Darwinian idea that we evolved from primates, and um, which I didn't have a problem with at all. Um, but I was particularly interested in the way we. Um, we, we sort of constructed ourselves, and I'm, I'm sort of using engineering terminology here, the, the materials that we use to build one of the most complex neural systems that, that is known to science. Um, it was out with the models used for primates. It was as if we were somehow, we had completely different rules, and um, I became aware, partly through a friend, that um, the materials that we were using were being heated in air sort of oxidized heavily and then we were building the most complex neural system we knew out of them and from my limited academic studies it didn't make any sense so that I mean that was one quite solid early platform that I pondered for some while and I thought well it's not too difficult to do some self-experimentation I, I did a little bit of reading around and I tried to approximate I changed my diet basically and tried to approximate I guess the biochemistry of what I, I felt a so what was your diet before and what did you change it to? Um, it, it was, I, I guess, fairly average for a, a sort of Western European diet. It was not particularly healthy, not particularly unhealthy, sort of cooked vegetables and some cooked meat and rarely some sort of salad and a bit of fruit now and again. Um, and I, I tried to change that to a, exclusively a mixture of fruit, leaves and nuts, the things that I was understood that, that primates primarily ate. Um, that was, I was particularly interested in the biochemistry and how that, that okay. would affect, you know, the, the So function. when you say primates, what do you mean by that? Um, mostly our, our sort of closest relatives, as, as is currently understood, the sort of forest-dwelling apes, um, okay. orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas. Um, and, and possibly related to some of our extinct relatives as well and what, what they may have been eating. And why did you think that diet was better than your previous diet? What, what kind of <coughs> drew you there? Well, I, I think it was initially a, a limited understanding of how delicate some of these plant molecules are uh, and if they were an integral part of biological evolution for tens of millions of years, that's very, very long time scales, um, and then they were being taken out of the realms of biology and into chemistry, and we were the only species doing that voluntarily, 
uh, well, that's an interesting experiment. It's presumed not to make any difference. It's presumed that, well, you can put anything in and you can still build the most complex neural system that we know and it, it'll work fine. So I thought, well, maybe there's something to look at here. So you felt that we'd lost our way with our diet and we changed our diet and that was to our detriment. Yes, yeah, in, in a, at that time in a very simplistic sense, a sort of uh, a classic, you are what you eat. Well, if, if, if we built ourselves from um, sort of fruits and vegetables for eons and then suddenly we weren't, in an engineering sort of sense, that I'd expect there to be a change. If you build something differently, it usually works differently. So yes, I felt there'd been a change and it may well be detrimental. On the other hand, we can say that man has evolved so much in that time, I don't know what that time frame is, 100,000, 200,000 years or whatever. It's incredible how we've evolved in terms of our ability to do so many things. Um, yeah, although I'd, I'd immediately question how we categorize and qualify, qualify evolution in a technological or industrial sense. I mean, yes, the, the, there is clearly, humans do clearly possess a genius, which interests me. But if you look at how we apply that and where it's actually led us in terms of our quality of life and what we've done with that technology, to see those things as independently, it doesn't work for me. The, you know, most, most of our effort goes into building machines to kill each other. And yes, they're phenomenally advanced, but look what we do with it. So we've got this tremendous ability, but we're using it the wrong way, you're saying? Um, that's part of it. I mean, I'm, t I'm talking about the genesis of my interest. Um, yes, it did evolve, yes. you know, so I was starting with quite basic ideas. And as I say, it was relatively easy to, to change some of those inputs and just see what happened. Because I know one of the things you talk about beginning your book, which is quite fascinating, is you experimented with sleep deprivation for a time. I think that was around the <coughs> mid-90s. Yeah, that came a little bit later. Um, <coughs> as I said, I, I made this change in in diet or the building materials um, without any particular agenda. It was just a curiosity, really. Um, and within about two to three years, I, I began to notice some differences. Not not anything too profound, but enough to keep me curious. Uh, the way my mind seemed to work seemed to be sharper. I seemed to be able to see information differently. It's very difficult to define, but it, it felt different anyway. Um, and that by that time I'd become more interested in some of these traditions that perhaps a few years earlier I'd have been quite sceptical or just not interested in the sort of what, what, I'd, what I'd later come to term as the sort of mystical traditions or the, the, the sort of ancient approaches to altered states of consciousness. Um, I began to see them as a sort of, well, is, is there a, what I call a scientific basis to that rather than it just being some esoteric nonsense as I might have described it at one time. Um, and uh, I think it was around about 1995, um, I'd pondered many of the techniques that I'd heard about or read about, um, and one in particular, for various reasons, came to the surface. It was uh, sleep deprivation or intentionally staying awake, and I'd read about it in, I think, Vision Quest, and it's part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest written texts there are, and so on. And I'd noticed when I got quite enthusiastic about what I was doing, I'd end up being up four, five, six in the morning and feeling, if anything, more insightful and more intrigued by what I was, you know, sort of pondering. And it, it struck me almost intuitively that, yeah, there's something interesting about human sleep, um, from sleepwalking, for example, to the literature where people have come up with astounding breakthroughs either in their dreams or in the early early hours when they're sort of tired and yet some flash of inspiration will emerge unexpectedly. Um, so again, it, it struck me as a very easy thing to test. It's not, you know, there's, there's no prohibition about keeping yourself awake. Um, and I was also aware that um, because of the three or four years I'd changed my diet by that time, it would be an interesting combination, probably quite unique or relatively unique anyway.